It's a given that not every movie can make a couple billion dollars, like Avengers Endgame or Avatar. But some go the complete opposite direction, bombing so badly they lose tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of dollars for their poor studio. Let's reflect on 10 of the biggest box office disasters ever, and let us know in the comments which ones we missed. As of this video's recording, Cats is still in theaters, and could theoretically bounce back and become a major moneymaker. Realistically, however, there's no way. Cats is in every sense of the word a cinematic disaster piece. You might think a movie based on one of the most popular Broadway musicals in history would do just fine, especially with an all-star cast, including Idris Elba, Dame Judi Dench, Sir Ian McKellen, Jennifer Hudson, Jason Derulo, and Taylor Swift. Even the plot making no sense whatsoever would have been excusable. After all, few understood the musical's plot, and that didn't harm its bottom line. So the Cats movie might well have succeeded, except for the part where everyone looked like your worst nightmare. Cat bodies were CGI'd onto the actors, who kept their human faces, making the whole thing look like an utter acid trip. They were supposed to have completely filled up the uncanny valley by 2019, and yet here was Kat stumbling headfirst into it. To make matters worse, the choreography was strangely sexual, a term nobody in their right mind ever used to describe the musical. But for the film, Swift and Derulo and all the others slinked and purred and slithered and tongue-lapped their way into everyone's discomfort zone. Perhaps worst of all, Cats was released to theaters while incomplete. Days after the film's debut, the studio recalled it because one of Dench's hands hadn't been CGI. You could see her human hands, complete with her wedding ring. A studio playing take backsies with a film they had already released was practically unheard of until Cats. And no, it did not bode well. Seeing Dame Judi Dench with proper kitty paws did not a more popular movie make. It's earned just $40 million against a production and marketing budget totaling $215 million, making it one of the biggest money sucks in film history. A movie about a YouTube cat running around the kitchen for no reason would make more bank than this utter embarrassment. Usually it's good when a film remains faithful to the book it's based on. With 1997's Lolita, however, that clearly was not the case. The book, after all, concerns perhaps the most taboo subject in human civilization, an adult carrying on a sexual relationship with a young child. Even with star power like Jeremy Irons and Dominic Swan, the public's unwillingness to engage with such a story meant this film had no chance whatsoever. It didn't help that, to many filmgoers, the 1962 Stanley Kubrick version was the only take on Lolita they needed. Despite pulling in under $10 million, Kubrick's film only cost $2 million to make, and was thus a financial success. It was also an artistic one, despite or perhaps because of the Hayes Code, forcing Kubrick to tone down the film's explicit nature. By 1997, however, director Adrian Lin could explore Humbert Humbert's Lolita obsession as explicitly as he pleased. He did just that. The film is extremely faithful to the book. And therein lies the problem. The book is simply too controversial for many to embrace a movie just like it. Lolita had an extremely hard time finding both a distributor and theaters that would show it. Finally, they managed to release the film in just enough theaters to qualify it for awards. That, coupled with little to no advertising, turned the film into a humongous money pit. It made just over $1 million against a $62 million budget. Oh, and those awards it hoped to qualify for? It won precisely zero of them. Lolita might actually be a decent film. Many critics liked it, and it currently has a 68% rating on Rotten Tomatoes. But if so, then it's a decent film that doesn't have a home anywhere. One of the most famous flops of all time, the 2003 Ben Affleck and Jennifer Lopez romantic comedy Gigli didn't suffer from bad PR or nightmarish CGI. Rather, it was simply a dreadful film that virtually everyone on the planet agreed was dreadful. Think of that. Some brutally bad films have actually made money. The Master of Disguise made over $40 million, for example. There is a market for terrible films. Even still, nobody saw Gigli, as everybody agreed to do so was a waste of time. Featuring a ridiculous storyline, no real romance despite being a romantic comedy, little action despite its mobster angle, and Affleck and Lopez displaying little chemistry despite being Benefer in real life, Gigli ran out of gas from the very start. After a horrific opening weekend, its studio abruptly stopped all advertising. This naturally meant a far worse second weekend, and the film was completely out of theaters by its third weekend. 
Overall, Gili earned just under $7.3 million against a budget of $75.6 million. It won six Razzies that year, including Worst Picture, Actor, Actress, Director, Screenplay, and Couple. It picked up another Razzie the year after for being the worst comedy in the Razzie's 25-year history. As for Gili's Razzie-winning director, Martin Brest, he hasn't directed or worked on anything since. That's 16 years and counting of utter inactivity. If Hollywood essentially fires you because your work is that bad, that says more than any piddling box office receipt ever could. These days, pirate movies are big money, thanks mostly to Johnny Depp's turn as Captain Jack Sparrow in the Pirates of the Caribbean films. But what if we told you a pirate movie came out 25 years ago and was so bad, so terribly received, and lost such an ungodly amount of money that it took down an entire production company and derailed the pirate genre for nearly a decade? Cutthroat Island was that film. It was meant to be a swashbuckling epic, except that everything that could go wrong did. For starters, its production company Carolco Pictures budgeted the film at $60 million. Due to various issues including shooting delays, numerous script rewrites, nearly the entire set getting rebuilt because the director didn't like it, a couple dozen crew members quitting at once, and broken pipes spilling raw sewage into the actor's swimming area, the budget wound up being at least $100 million. But hey, it's a fun pirate epic that could easily make a couple hundred million, right? Certainly, except for one problem. The movie was god-awful. Nobody bought Gina Davis as a pirate captain. The story made no sense, the stunts were ridiculous, there was little humor to speak of, and the romance between Davis and Matthew Modine was more unrealistic than that time Urkel and Laura were Romeo and Juliet in that one episode of Family Matters. All that, plus distributor MGM putting very little effort into marketing the film, meant Cutthroat Island walked the plank within seconds of boarding the ship. It made a mere $10 million, making it one of the biggest money losers in cinematic history. Adjusted for inflation, the movie lost nearly $150 million. Johnny Depp couldn't down all the rum fast enough. Some movies don't bomb because of poor advertising or production horror stories. Sometimes people simply see an ad for the film and collectively decide that looks like utter garbage. Eddie Murphy's 2002 disaster The Adventures of Pluto Nash is just such a movie. You don't even need to see the movie to conclude it's terrible. One look at the poster, featuring a ridiculously exaggerated Murphy eyebrow raise, overly cartoonish title text, and a cringe-inducing tagline like The Man on the Moon, is all you need to realize the film is not for you or anyone else. Even even if the film itself was good, few took the chance to find out. Despite costing around $120 million to make, Pluto Nash earned a mere $7 million back. It's very possible that once adjusted for inflation, Nash lost more money than even the mighty Cutthroat Island. Oh, and in case you're wondering if the film is secretly good, it's not. It's poorly acted, unfunny, boring, badly written, and despite costing so much money, it simply looks cheap. But don't take our word for it. One of the film's stars, Joe Pantoliano, once admitted to Pluto Nash, you usually can't tell when a movie is going to be shit, but on that one, you could. If that's not a sign this movie should have been abandoned on Pluto long before its premiere, nothing is. It's easier to find a unicorn than a Disney movie that flops. Even their failures, such as Solo, earned hundreds of millions of dollars. 2011's Mars Needs Moms, however, was an unabashed financial disaster, perhaps the biggest money loser in Disney history. The plot was pure saccharine Disney. Cold, unloving Martians kidnapped a doting mother to absorb her mothering abilities for use in Martian nanny bots. The mother's son travels to Mars to save her, and the love between the two ultimately inspires the Martians to embrace love themselves. If that doesn't inspire you, imagine how moviegoers that year must have felt. That cliched setup combined with dead-eyed CGI that plunged straight into the uncanny valley, a whiny main character, no real heart, terrible reviews, and bad word of mouth meant Mars Needs Moms was as dead as the red planet itself. Against a $200 million production and marketing budget, the film raked in a mere $39 million. Mars doesn't need moms. It needs a better agent. Cartoon fans of a certain age fondly recalled Dudley Do-Right, the heroic yet painfully stupid Mountie with a sense of justice as hard as his head. But just because people liked a 30-year-old cartoon doesn't mean it has to become a live-action movie. And yet in 1999, somebody made Dudley Do-Right the movie anyhow. That somebody paid with both their wallet and their reputation. The film is exactly as you'd expect. Brendan Fraser, who's basically a real-life Dudley Do-Right anyhow, plays the mistake-addled Mountie as he fights Snidely Whiplash, gets the girl, and gets thrown off his horse. But that alone couldn't gain an audience for the film. 
It offered little for adults to enjoy, and young kids of that era barely knew about Dudley, so they chose to see literally anything else, leaving poor Dudley to twist in the Canadian wind. The film cost $70 million to produce and only grossed $10 million. When something fails that badly, there's really only one thing to do – immediately try again. The very next year saw a live-action Rocky and Bullwinkle that cost $75 million to make. But unlike Dudley, Moose and Squirrel earned an incredible $35 million. Clearly, nostalgia can only take you so far when moviegoers aren't actually all that nostalgic for you. If you're going to make a crazy farce, there are two things you absolutely shouldn't do. One, don't make everyone in the film crazy and wacky. Straight characters simply make the humor better and easier to swallow. Two, don't pretend your crazy farce is anything but a crazy farce. Rarely do moviegoers respond well to being lied to through trailer. Bruce Willis's 1991 turkey Hudson Hawk was guilty of both, and bombed severely as a result. It played like a wacky, mad cop parody of the action films that had made Willis a household name, but it was simply too wacky. There were no straight faces, only a group of clowns who knew what they were saying was funny and wanted to make sure you knew it too. That to many audiences is just plain tiresome. Worse still, trailers and advertisements made it seem like Hudson Hawk was yet another serious action flick in the vein of Die Hard. The film's tagline, catch the excitement, catch the adventure, catch the hawk, simply made the whole thing seem even more serious. So when audiences realized it was actually a goofy comedy, they responded by staying away and putting their money toward films that didn't lie to them. Against a $65 million budget, Hudson Hawk grossed a mere $17 million. To this day, the film's reputation is that of a pure stinker, proving that time does not heal all wounds. Catch the excitement, catch the adventure, catch another film. After Kevin Costner struck gold with Dances with Wolves, he concluded the public was itching for as many big, bloated, overly long Costner epics as he could muster. The problem was, he was wrong. People liked Dances with Wolves because it was a great film. They hated his other bloated epics because, well, they weren't. Nowhere was this more evident than with Costner's 1997 Oopsie, The Postman. It's a three-hour post-apocalyptic slog about a nameless drifter who stumbles upon an old postal worker's uniform, puts it on, and claims to represent a restored U.S. government. This fills everyone with hope, except the people watching in the theater, of which there weren't many. The Postman cost around $80 million to make and only earned $20 million at the box office. Dances with Wolves, meanwhile, cost about $25 million to make and earned well over $400 million. What on earth happened to Kevin Costner's mojo? Well, between Wolves and Postman, he attempted other films that felt less epic and more overly long. 1994's Wyatt Earp bombed badly, and 1995's Waterworld barely made back its gigantic budget. So by 1997, people were done with Kevin Costner needlessly taking up hours of their life at a time. As for The Postman itself, too many people found the savior mailman premise silly, rather than epic and hopeful. So they stayed away, and Costner's career never fully recovered. At least we'll always have the Lakota tribe. Just because your film is for kids doesn't mean you'll get away with making it terrible and stupid. Kids can sense out garbage just as well as adults. And when 2006's Zoom showed up, kids everywhere smelled trash. Zoom tells the story of five kids between the ages of 6 and 17, all of whom have amazing superpowers. But unlike other kid hero flicks like The Incredibles, Zoom offered little humor, even less heart, far too much predictability, and worst of all, 2006 Tim Allen. This was, to put it mildly, a bad year for Mr. Home Improvement. Not only did he win a Worst Actor Razzie for Zoom, but he was also nominated for Santa Claus 3 and Shaggy Dog. Whatever family appeal mojo he once had was not on display that year, and indeed rarely seems to be anymore, unless he's voicing Buzz Lightyear. All this resulted in an expensive disaster for Sony Pictures. Zoom cost over $75 million to make and earned back a mere $12.5 million. Tim Allen couldn't return to the world of Toy Story fast enough. 